Good evening and welcome to episode 312 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzama Dungwa Kumalo. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to the only daily property podcast in South Africa that helps you on all your property needs. It doesn't matter where in your property journey you are, we certainly have to provide a great resource to help you make better property decisions. And to all our regular viewers at home, whether you're watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, or even on Instagram, welcome to it. You know how we do every single weekday. You and I have an appointment where we're always in conversation with a property expert who helps us navigate our property journey. And of course, I absolutely love hearing from you at home, love seeing the love that you show us, especially in the comment section uh, when for the people who are watching us on Facebook. So do show us some love, love seeing those green hearts that you always send us. And of course, share the live so your friends and family can join in in the property conversation. And talking about the property conversation, you can, of course, catch other shows across private properties of social media pages every single weekday at 8 p.m. As it is a Wednesday, you can catch award winning farmer Umbali Nuoko later on. Uh, no, it's not actually, it's Wednesday. So it's actually Esther Klassen uh, who's going to be bringing the first time home bias show. I know she'll be in conversation with somebody that we've had a few times on the you know on the private property podcast with myself that is Usilindi Lelisiane and they'll be looking at you know women being able to access property uh, without having a lot of money down so that's going to be a great conversation that you can look forward to at 8 p.m with SD class and every Wednesday and every Tuesdays and Thursdays that's when you can catch award-winning farmer Umbali Nwoko bringing you all things agriculture and always speaking with great experts who help us have a better grasp on our agricultural needs. And every Mondays and Fridays, Chad brings you through the Home Shoppers Show. So if you're in the market for a new property, make sure that you tune in to the show as he takes us through exquisite properties that you can find on www.privateproperty.co.za. Those are the great shows that you can catch every single weekday at 8 p.m. So do make sure that you set your appointment. And of course, there's myself every single weekday at 7 p.m. We are uh, have we're always in conversation and of course have an appointment where there's always some other property topic uh, that we are tackling that helps us along in our journey. This evening's conversation is primarily for tenants and landlords. And this is quite a big one because uh, we're still unfortunately seeing a large number of both tenants and landlords not having a very good understanding of you know, the legal parameters when it comes to you know, lease agreements and uh, living in a rented property, what you can or cannot do from both sides. And so this evening we're going to be looking at what you need to know about the Rental Housing Act. 
Act, but the new Rental Housing Act, as you've probably been following up, it's you know it's been it's gotten amended, um, and there've been some changes uh, that were tabled in the amended version. I think it is the um, the 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 amendment. The last amendment was the Rental Housing Amendment Act 35 of 2014. And we've seen some of the changes that uh, a lot of people within the property space have actually, some have welcomed. Uh, others are saying it's making things even more difficult for landlords. Well, this evening we're going to be looking at key um, things that you need to be aware of. And 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 I, and I said, this one is actually a big one for tenants and landlords because you're really going to get a good grasp of what the legal parameters are, what these changes mean for both landlords and tenants, and what happens in the event where especially as a tenant uh, as especially as a landlord in the event where you don't keep to what the act um, essentially prescribes and to help us get a better sense of a lot of the legalities because i know law can be one of those very intimidating uh things i was saying to you know to my guests off air that i am actually doing one of the courses i'm doing is you know property law so i know how how dense it can get but we're, we're doing a really great uh, executive summary of this and not looking at sub clauses uh, because that, that's not what we're here for. And my guest this evening is uh, Megan Lipbrook, who's the general manager at Only Realty Group. Megan, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Zama, how are you? I'm really great, Megan. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us on the show. Now, I think. The big thing with this, um, you know, with the Amendment Act is perhaps let's take it from from the top, you know, because as we were talking, Ophir, one of the things I, I had asked you was, I, I was trying to check if it's now in effect or the president still hasn't been gazetted yet because I feel as though this has been such a, a long ongoing thing. A part of me thought maybe it had been gazetted, it's now in law, I'm just not aware of it because I know a lot of property professionals are like already act as though it's already in law um, as opposed to you know waiting for it to finally be gazetted and be in law. Perhaps first just take us through the previous version where we are now because I know it's, it's a long historical sort of lesson if we look at the Rental Housing Act in its entirety and let's not do that. Let's fast forward to uh, essentially where we currently are. Where now. we are today. Um, yeah. So um, firstly I think it's it's great that people are acting as if it already is um, enforced. It's currently not, um, but the changes are all really positive changes. Uh, I know people have been a little bit uncertain, but the, the changes are good. So the sooner people can adapt to them, the easier it will be when it is gazetted, it is um, enforced. So the biggest change um, that we've seen that I think will affect most landlords, especially landlords that are renting their house out privately, is you can no longer have a verbal lease agreement. So that, I think, is a big thing um, to protect tenants, but also to protect the owner, um, having everything down in writing, having everything that everybody understands in clear language, that everyone's on the same page. It can only be a positive thing. So ultimately, the act as a whole, the changes, the amendments, is really just providing better protection for tenants. Mm. And, and I think, Megan, one of the things, uh, and it's what you've just said now, that it's providing better protection for tenants. I know that a lot of landlords uh, already feel as though the law protects tenants uh, almost unequally relative to them. And that and that's probably a discussion for you know, a different day. And, and more often than not, when landlords say that, I always push back and say, you actually need to fundamentally understand uh, the historical context of yeah. why that would be the case. And it's, it's just too far soon from where we come from historically to suddenly place, you know, landlords with uh, quite a significant amount of power. So we almost need to put those systems in place uh, because the reality of a lot of South Africans is they, they still pretty much live that reality, right? So in as much as it can be frustrating for, you know, for landlords, especially when they end up dealing with you know, tenants who are you know, paying or damaging their property or whatever they case uh we we need to also understand the 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 era that we're living in and the context that we're living in. And, and this is really me saying this to, to landlords. And as a landlord myself, uh, as a property investor myself, I know how painful uh, it can be with not 
the tenants um, and if anything, then I've been fortunate that that hasn't been a, a reality that I've, I've faced for the most part. But we really do need to not forget where we are from a historical um, perspective. Now, I see some of the love that we're getting on our Facebook page, um, Abdullah al -Butin. So the second time I'm seeing you, the team has been sending me, of course, all the different you know, um, comments that you say down here below. So this is twice in a row. And of course, our regular Matashi Nani Wacky Wednesday, Optimogal, a special greeting to my ladies. We're back at it later. Of course, we are back at it. She's referring to SEC as well as Muslimi Lisiyan uh, that will be coming on to your screens at 8 with the first time home buyers show and seeing more and more love on our social media pages many of you at home and we do love it um, and i'll be coming back to those shortly um megan i want us to look at very touch things that the um the, the amendment act uh, insists on which is a decent writing you know that as stands people are effectively able to have
Welcome back to episode 312 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantu Mwakumalo. Well, we had some gremlins in the system, but we're back and we do apologize for that break in transmission. Um, and of course, we have been getting quite a lot of love from you on our social media pages. Those of you who are watching us on Facebook, uh, Tamsin Sogangile, I see you. Um, I also see uh, who is this Bongani Queen B, Mabunda, Uwanga, Tabile. And of course, this evening we're looking at what you need to know about the new rental housing act i'm in conversation with megan ladbrook who's a general manager at only realty group and really looking at what the new changes mean for both landlord and the tenant uh, you know before we cu- we got cut off megan i was saying that the one key thing that you've already outlined is uh, that the lease agreement must be in writing. Let's go through some of the other you know, key changes that um, are going to also protect tenants. Um, as you were saying earlier, that one of the, the, the core things with the amendment is that tenants are going to be very well protected um, when this comes into effect. So, so Sam, I think the scariest thing for landlords is that now they'll be held criminally liable if they um, don't comply with the new regulations. Uh, so, I mean, that's a that's a huge change and it's really beneficial for tenants. I know it's scary for landlords, but if you're a landlord who's uh, got great intentions and doing what you should be doing and looking after your, your tenant, who's essentially your client, you know, you running a, a service, they're taking the service from you. So it's really holding them accountable for taking care of their clients. Um, so I think that's probably the scariest thing that and what I've seen that people have latched onto the most out of these changes. But ultimately you shouldn't have been doing these things the wrong way in the first place. So if your intentions are good and you're going to be um, honouring the terms of your agreement, then you shouldn't be concerned. Mm-hmm. And it's such a big one. I think one of the, the, the things that I I appreciate about it is, uh, and, and we we're talking about this, you know, of air, and it's already something that we know is not legal to do uh, in in any case in South Africa, and that is denying tenants access to you know your property in the event where you know they're not paying or cutting off things like water and electricity, and and we know that that's such a key thing uh, to have consequences of because what we're currently seeing now is you know landlords are still doing it i mean i've said to viewers at home before that i've certainly been in in groups where landlords will say you know i bring in guys or we take in a door or we cut all kinds of utilities and change the locks and, and all these kinds of things, right? I mean, landlords literally sharing tips of how they've uh, gotten, uh, you know, rid of not paying tenants. Uh, in as much as the landlords know that that is not legal, there are also no really uh, ramifications when they do do it, and that's why they've been able to, uh, you know, get away with it so much. Uh, you know, Megan, I want you to just take us through the issue of the deposit because this is also one of those things that becomes such a contentious one. I've seen way too many tenants. Uh, not know about what can or cannot be done about their deposit or landlords misusing uh, the deposit. Perhaps take us through the handling of the deposit. So, some of the deposit is probably, it's, it's such a big financial investment for a tenant. You know, if you're a tenant, in most instances, it's a huge cash flow um, issue right at the beginning of the lease. It's a lot of money to you. Um, I know in different parts of the country, there's different deposit amounts and Cape Town are often a double deposit. So people are really placing a lot of trust in the person who's handling the deposit. So at the moment, um, it needs to be placed into an interest-bearing account. Um, Often the landlord has it or if he's managing his own property or the agency. And that deposit needs to stay there and it's it's not to be touched. It's not for... um, rainy day money and I know here like you have plenty of horror stories where land will just use the deposits you know for whatever they feel like it Um, but it's it's not it's not for that and at any point during the lease agreement the tenant has the right to ask say I'd like to see um, how much interest I've earned it's still their money until they move out and if there's any damages so ultimately the deposit is there for security for the landlord but it still belongs to the tenant so when the tenant moves out, the onus is on the landlord now to make sure that they've done a proper inspection when the tenant moved in, that they've noted all of the damages, that they have a comprehensive report, and only if there's anything that's been maliciously damaged by the tenant can they then take that money from the deposits. Mm. 
and, and I want to find out from the viewers at home, especially the landlords, about how clued up are you when it comes to the law and what you can or cannot do as a landlord? Because I tend to find that a lot of DIY landlords in particular, uh, you know, you get into property investment, you buy your first investment property, perhaps the second and the third and the fourth, and you've got a full-time job, you know, or you're running your own business that's not the property business. And property was the side investment that you were doing um, that you thought, look, I'll actually self-manage. I'm not going to uh, get an estate agent to do it for me. And because this is not your core job, you may not necessarily be as up to uh, date with what the law says you can or cannot do. So if you're a landlord at home, uh, you know, how clued up are you about the, the law when it, uh, as, it, as it pertains to you as a landlord and what you can or cannot do um, when it comes to your relationship with your tenant? Now, Megan, I want to find out then what does the, the new amendment act, uh, you know, what does it mean for the DIY landlord? Because I think uh, in as much as they are not the biggest demographic, we're increasingly seeing more and more people, you know, being able to access investment properties and managing it themselves. Many watch the show and are always finding, you know, trying to find different ways of maximizing their investment. And with some, they've decided I'd rather not use an agency because of, you know, that percentage cut every month. I'll just do it myself. So what does the new amendment um, act effectively? You know, how does that, how would it affect um, the DIY landlords? So, so this, the changes aren't actually that great. So, you know, I, I feel like the DIY landlord is, is in the position where they just need to make sure that they educate themselves as much as possible. Um, it's really easy for them to sort of get into, as you say, most of these things are often done through ignorance. It's not their core job. Um, so even if you can't uh, justify in your, in your cost structure having a professional agency run your, your managed rental for you, um, I'd really encourage them to reach out and ask for, for help or advice or guidance. Um, you know, it's a very small industry. Uh, most people would be happy to give a landlord a bit of advice on, on a difficult situation. So the tools are there. Um, the act is very clear. It's, it's not a difficult act to read or to understand. Um, so I'd encourage them, if you're a DIY landlord, definitely um, download a copy of the act from, from the government website and make notes, go through it, ask questions, phone a, a rental agency in your area that's um, got a lot of clients and see if they'd just be willing to just go through it with you and clarify. Um, but ultimately, the changes that they, they need to be aware of um, are all quite simple changes. Make sure that you have all of your ducks in a row. Make sure you have a written agreement. Uh, make sure that you keep your investment property that you're renting out in good condition. It needs to be... Um, habitable for somebody to live in. You can't um, cut off their services and, and do all of these kinds of things. So I think the, the biggest tip I would have for a DIY landlord is just to make sure that they they put themselves in the position of, of power where they understand what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. Mm -mm -mm. We are this evening taking your questions and comments as we look at what you need to know about the new Rental Housing Act and really getting a better understanding of what the amendments mean uh, for both tenants and landlords. Uh, we've got Uspami on Facebook saying, I've never heard a deposit earning interest. It's always you damage this 1,500 minus 1,000 for paint, other repairs minus 500. And, and I mean, I can already say as part that, that that's not the way it's supposed to be um, your deposit is is put in an interest bearing account it, it doesn't necessarily have to be sort of maximum interest so a landlord can choose whichever interest bearing account they they opt for um, and even when it comes to the deductions in terms of damage there's a way that uh, we look at you know damage so fair wear and tear wouldn't be something that you know a tenant would pay for because it would be understood that that was going to happen regardless of which tenant uh, would have occupied your particular property. And Megan, I mean, would you say you see that quite a lot? Because I see this a lot, especially with the DIY landlords. Um, and sometimes even when they use an agency where the agency only procured the tenant and the, the landlord decides to manage the tenant, uh, so the deposit gets handed over and the agency sort of done, they take their cut. And come end of the lease agreement, these issues with the deposit. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's such a um, misunderstanding about wear and tear and what what's damaged and what's wear and tear. Um, the landlord can't expect the property to be perfect. If it was perfect when they gave the tenant, you've got to expect that there will be some use from somebody living there. And unfortunately, that means that it's, you know, you're going to switch the light switch on and off or use the blinds or turn the door handle. It might not be in perfect condition when the tenant moves out. I mean, that that's a huge misunderstanding, I think, that um, we see as an agency uh, that, that neither the tenant or the landlord understand what that means. So you'll get into the position where the tenants agree to paying for things which they really shouldn't, um, and the landlords not um, through anything other than not understanding what they can charge and can't charge for, end up charging for more than they should be. Mm-hmm. And I've certainly seen those, you know, happening too many times. I can't think of an instance where a tenant would, uh, you know, fairly pay for something like paint, especially after a, a year of staying in a place. Uh, I mean, you would have had to physically have done something to the wall that has damaged it to the point where new paint is needed. But sort of normal, uh, you know, dirt on a wall when somebody lives there, the tenant isn't meant to pay for that in the event where a landlord wants a new coat of paint for their new tenant, they're able to do that. But that's certainly something that would have to come from um, their own account. One of the other things, uh, Megan, is around the defects being recorded. Uh, and, and, and I see this one even in the context of the um, of the deposits or at the end of the, the term, but we're still not seeing a lot of entry inspections, for, for instance, um, and tenants moving into a place and within sometimes even a few days realizing what is wrong and they'll communicate it to a landlord often via phone so it's also again not written and because there was no inspection by the time they move out then they'll say well my landlord is now pinning all these damages on me and yet when i moved in i actually had them i had noted them and i was communicating it with them all along how can tenants best deal with that in the interim because it is one of those contentious things that continue to happen and more often than not tenants don't know of a of an entry inspection and an exit inspection um during their you know during their leasing years yeah. So again, it's something that happens so often, and I, I, I wish there was an easy answer to this. Um, ultimately, a tenant needs to understand that the landlord should be doing an inspection with them when they move into the property. So with the amendments, if there's no inspection done, um, then everyone assumes that the property is in, in good condition and that there's nothing that can can be um, deducted from the tenant's deposit when they move out because there's obviously no record of those damages in the first place. Um, If I were a tenant at the moment, I would make sure if my landlord hasn't done an inspection with me, that when I move in, I I do an inspection myself. I note everything down uh, in writing and email it to your your landlord so you've got that there. And and vice versa, if you're a landlord, um, there's no negativity or no downside to not doing an inspection with your tenant. Um, There's only positives for you. It's, It's a Very time-consuming job, but it can be done quickly and it'll save you a lot of time in the long run, um, especially with the he said, she said, back and forth when the tenant moves out. Mm-hmm. More of your questions and comments at home as we explore the um, the, the amended rental housing act. And we've got Bong Sabakwe, uh, one of our top fans, commenting, saying, "In the UK, the government runs the deposit scheme, so the landlord pays your deposit into the scheme. The money is only released when you and the la- landlord come to an agreement on what is to be paid to you and what is to be paid to the landlord. Your money is paid with interest, and that's a great way of, I guess." Uh, you know, managing that. I don't know if I want government to be involved in in, in that aspect <laughs> when we look at the South African context. Um, I certainly wouldn't want uh, government holding any of the deposits <laughs> to my properties. Uh, we've got Ulinati Zimba. Ulinati, the first time I'm seeing your name. Welcome to the show. And Ulinati asks, um, what else can one do to get rid of non-paying tenants without having to go through eviction as it is usually a lengthy and costly process? So the, the, the short answer is there's nothing uh, 
legally that you can do to to make a tenant move if they're not paying without getting a court order eviction. Uh, this doesn't have to be a lengthy process and it doesn't have to be an extremely costly process either. Um, what goes a long way to helping is if you as a landlord uh, or or your rental agency, make sure that they follow the correct process leading up to the eviction, because that can really pave the way for a very smooth eviction. Um, but, but things unfortunately need to be done the right way and the legal way. Uh, we often find if you've got a really good relationship with your tenant, uh, especially now COVID has impacted so many people and, mm -hmm. and earnings have, and we've seen as a industry, obviously a lot of challenges. But we've also seen a lot of people coming together and working out arrangements and payment arrangements. So obviously step one is to try and have a conversation with your tenant and come to some sort of um, understanding between the two of you. But in, in that same time frame, you need to be making sure that you follow the correct process, make sure you um, put your tenants in breach, make sure that you follow everything to the, the letter of the law. Because then if it does come down to being evicted, you've got everything lined up and your attorney can actually just run with it a lot in a lot smoother manner which obviously will end up costing you less mm. and that's certainly something that one of the regular guests that we have in the show Sina Stain also you know emphasizes that when you do everything to the latter of the law um, before it even gets to eviction stage, by the time things get there, uh, you find that judges are quicker to be able to grant that eviction order. Whereas if you, you know, you get to court and you know the judge magistrate finds out that actually you've you know tried you've cut water supplies previously or tried all sorts of illegal stunts, you're more likely not to have that eviction order granted, which exactly. only makes things more worse for you because then yeah. your tenants are going to stay in your property. Um, and you're still going to struggle to, to um, essentially get them off your property. Uh, a comment coming through from Ongadego Ahape saying, a reputable agency wanted me to pay for paint after, after having occupied the property for five years. According to the person I spoke to at the agency, even if I had stayed 10 years, I'd have to pay for the paint, which is absurd, right, Megan? I mean, after five years would typically be when you know, we, we do a new paint job, so a five to even seven years, even in our normal homes, we would typically do uh, a paint job. So the fact that agencies and even landlords um, will say pulling a fast one on, on, on tenants and making yeah. home improvements and um, something that tenants suddenly have to pay for I think is something that more and more tenants need to be empowered about in order to to best address the, the painting is something that comes up often and um, we, we see it every month there's a big difference between if a tenant's damaged a wall and obviously then they're responsible for fixing it and we do see that regularly uh, where people have um drilled lots of holes in the wall and sort of taken chunks out the wall when they took the hook out. So there, there definitely are cases to be made for when painting is obviously the tenant's responsibility, but uh, it happens very regularly that, as you say, home improvements done on the tenant's account uh, is the expectation. Um, and we, even as, as agents, get onto the wrong side of um, owners. You know, we try and keep everything above board and then you know you're not going to make your landlord happy if you're not letting them renovate the property on the tenant's account so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe before i let you go any final tips for both the landlords and the tenants to just be aware of when it comes to uh the amend uh, the amendment act so i think on both sides um and I know I've said this before um this evening definitely educating themselves is really the key and there's so much available to landlords and tenants. Um, familiarise yourself with the, the Act, um, get the contact details for the Rental Housing Tribunal. You know, they're there to mediate these situations. If there's something that uh, doesn't make sense to the tenant or doesn't make sense to the landlord and you can't agree on it. So I think educating themselves about the changes and, and just making sure that they try and act in as fair a way to both parties as possible. And that's a great place to leave it at this evening, Megan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Emma. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone.
And that is Megan Ledbrook, who is the general manager at Only Realty Group. Wrapping up the Wednesday edition of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzaman Dungwa Kumalo. I'll be back on your screens tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe. We'll be right